Welcome back to the HO Scale Bessemer in Lake Erie. I'm Ray Brown. Uh, I think I've alluded to in some older videos. Um, I want to document kind of how I've built the yard ladders and hand laid my switches. Um, I'm not going to go step by step and, um, and show how you do every little thing because frankly there's a lot of videos out there for that. Um, the Fast Tracks website is really, really good, showing you how to use all their tools. Um, I will keep pointing people back to Drew at the White, Liver, White River line uh, for how he built his ladder. Um, pretty, pretty similar to what I'm doing here. Um, and those videos are great. Uh, I'm not going to make anything better than those. So uh, I just want to document what I did. So a couple things right off the bat. One, I resisted for years and years buying a nice soldering iron rig. And then I saw Peter Lloyd Lee uh, using one of these uh, Hako soldering irons, and he mentioned how much he liked it. And I thought, what the heck, I'll give it a try. I need a new one anyway. And um, yeah, I was really dumb for not buying this sooner. It's awesome. Um... Past that, um, let me move some of this junk out of the way. You can kind of see the beginning of my process here. I printed the paper templates from uh, Fast Tracks. And I have all my center lines laid out of where my yard tracks will be. So I just get everything laid out, and then I very carefully glued down these paper templates in the right spot. Um, you know, just put a ruler on them, kind of made sure they were spaced pretty even. Had the laser shot down, you know, making sure the rails were all in alignment. And then um, I just uh, smeared wood glue on the wood and smoothed all this out with a liberal amount of wood glue. And when it dries, I mean, it's it's on there. It ain't ever coming off. Um, and then uh, drill out and kind of route out. I just make a big slot for the throw bars. I don't like to just drill a small hole and um, try to fight with it. I um, I find that once you put all the switch ties in there and anyway, you can't really see the slot unless you're looking for it. So after that, I, I laser cut my own ties. I have a little 40 watt cheap Chinese laser cutter and uh, I bought Fast Tracks ties and just put my calipers on them and copied uh, the dimensions into um, a program called QCAD. It is free. Um, takes a little bit. Probably, you know, I probably got a couple hours an evening for a week uh, rebuilding that DXF file. But then I can buy a switch, you know, worth of um, uh, basswood from Amazon for about a quarter. And... Uh, and I cut these out in a couple minutes. So, um, real cheap to do. Uh, for right now, I'm still buying the Fast Track uh, copper frets. I'm sure I'll crack that code eventually. Um, but once I get these glued in, I just roughly mark links, snip them off, and I glue in all the copper ties, which you can see back here. I've gotten some of the copper ties. Uh, glued in. After that, uh, I'm using Code 70 uh, microengineering rail, which I just buy in a bundle. Um, and you just kind of start laying it in. So like this, um, this switch here that I'm working on, I want one piece of rail to go from the frog up through and I just let it run out the whole length of rail now I mean I'll come back and isolate the frog but that's after it's all soldered so I lay the rail in about where I think it's going to go and sharpie mark the uh, where the closure rail comes in and then just use the fast tracks uh, filing jigs and everything else now I am sure you don't need to use all these tools but let me tell you how much easier it makes it all um, especially, I think, your level of artisticness, which I have very little. 
Uh, I'm a mechanical guy. Um, so the tools make it easy. And uh, just a note about the jigs, um, just because I'm sure somebody will ask. So I have a pile of these um, for all kinds of different switches. They've all paid for themselves several times over. Um, and this was the first way I ever made my own switch. And if you're getting into it and you're on the fence, get the jig. So I'm showing all this, you know, building not in the jig, but this will teach you how. These are, think of this as training wheels. Um, you, you really can't screw up in the jig. Um, and it kind of teaches you what's important and what to look for. So anyway, after you do that, I, um, I don't know if I'm going to see it or not. Probably not. Uh, no. But um, I have a point filed onto there for, um, I guess you can kind of see it, um, for half the frog. So I'm going to go ahead and solder the frog together and then we'll start getting that in place. You watch videos of people making switches and you get a few different opinions on everything. Uh, but one thing that I think people pretty much universally agree on, the frog is everything. The frog is very important. And for my non-trained friends, because believe it or not, there are some people out there that watch my videos that don't know anything about trains. This is the frog. It's this area from about here to about here, where, if you want to think about it, easy. The diverging rail crosses the stock rail. So where those rails cross each other and the gaps to let the flanges go through, this little setup we call the frog. Which, if you ever get an education in horses, that's also what they call a part in the hoof, and it sort of looks like that. Which makes me wonder if that's where the terminology comes from. Um, anyway, I have this little jig here from Fast Tracks. These are number six switches. So I'm in the number six slot, and you just slide your rails up uh, till they meet, and then solder your rails together good. Um, and you do want to solder them together good. Uh, you don't want this coming apart. Um, there's a lot of guys out there that try really hard to use a minimal amount of solder and everything else. I, I find once it's all painted, it's hard to see. I don't really worry about that. Um, I like to make sure it's in there good. So we will clean that end up a little. I just had that block on there just to help me hold everything in plane. So now you can see I've got this kind of unwieldy double piece of rail and you can't probably see it but there's one side filed off in here for the closure rail in the, the next switch so we'll go ahead and get that set in so this is the one thing I do a little bit different um, I like to put my stock rails in first um, so if you're not following switch terminology, uh, I'd encourage you to watch the fast track, uh, videos, uh, they explain everything so well. Um, but the stock rails are basically the rails that are unbroken that just go through the switch. So the outside rails would be another easy way to think about it. So to put the frog in. The hard part is figuring out, you know, how far in do you put it. And I think this is why some people like to start with the frog, because you can get a little more forgiveness. You can put the frog in and then set the other rails apart from it. But and I'm not going to be able to do this and hold the camera, so I'll just have to kind of show you what I'm going to do. I have these little rail gauges. And you know, I'll put I'll put a couple 
you know, on on one side to keep keep that parallel and straight. And I'll take my NMRA template and hold it in and I'll kind of slide this back and forth until I find the sweet spot. Then a lot of times I'll use this to kind of hold the rail while I get the first solder stick down. And once you do that, you check and double check and triple check with this thing just to make sure you got everything where you want it. Because once you get start getting multiple solder joints on, it gets harder to move. Um, yeah, and that's that's really all there is to it. And it there's no magic here. So let me go ahead and get this frog rail stuck in place, and this switch will start to look like the one in front of it. Or we've got the frog uh, diverging rails and the stock rails, but we don't have any of the closure rails or guide rails yet. Okay, and there's that rail stuck. So, I put just a bare minimum amount of solder there because that solder is going to interfere with uh, the point rails coming up. Um, but what I do is I'm just pretty careful putting those in and I make sure I remelt that solder. Uh, when I put the the wings in, um, and there's there's very little there, like I said, very little, just enough to get it to stick. Um, but you can see I've got my my gauges out here holding everything in gauge, and I put my NMRA gauge in there. That looks real nice. Now if I come over to the other side. That also looks real nice. I uh, I make sure I don't get these. Uh, they're definitely not tight. They're kind of to the loose side without dropping off the end of the gauge. Um, and that kind of helps bigger equipment go through the switches. Nice. So now that's the hard part. Now I can go ahead and with the spacers where they are right now, I'll go ahead and solder in those couple ties and I'll come and grab these next couple ties and I'll start gluing on to the uh, Central Valley ties um, and then I'll solder this guy um, just pretty much following the paper template but honestly I'm going to just let the rail take the bend it wants to um, now, you can influence the curve by pushing on it, but it'll go something like that, and just, just let it take the flow at once. And that's, uh, that's how you get these nice, uh, smooth, flowing uh, turnout ladders. Alright, I did see... Uh, I've never looked up split rock mining. Look up split rock mining. That guy, great layout. He's got some really great ideas. But he was saying that he makes his number six switches to where they're not really a number six. This is a 60 inch fast track radius. He more or less does this to where it's a 60 inch radius. And it takes up the space of a number six. And he runs like yellow stones and all kinds of giant equipment and it looks great. Um, I had this whole yard all pretty much, well, pretty much here before I, I, I caught that comment. Um, but I wish I'd caught it sooner. I think I would have copied that. And I think I will in some of my other yards I have to build. I have to change my DXF file on my my turnouts, but that's that's okay. All right, moving on. So I use these little triangular gauges uh, to sit and you know solder most of my straight joints. But when I get to this tie, this copper tie, right before the diverging rail starts to angle off. 
I use the NMRA gauge and I will put that in there at the absolute very widest it can be without dropping in and the reason I do that is that gives you more wiggle room for the closure rail coming over and that was one of the things I struggled with working in the templates was it seemed like I could never get I could never get this notch filed out enough and the closure rail thin enough to make everything smooth I mean don't don't hear me wrong they all work they were great and I've, I've got tons of them around the layout you know, these, these were made in the jig, but boy, you can see how razor thin that that closure, closure reel gets, and that gets them to be a little bit fragile. And um, if you just play with your, your tolerances and, and push that right to the plus, um, it really, really helps the game here. Okay, enough of that. All right, so here is this frog rail, all soldered down. I've got to get it glued onto the plastic ties yet, but you can see nice, smooth transition. And the only other thing I'll I'll put in here is a uh, my methodology. I'm not saying it's right. Um, I start at the frog and I work my way back. I don't skip any solder point. And that's a learned thing because there was a point that I thought, well, I'll get the first one or two soldered. And then I'll come down here and kind of get the rail where I want it, where I like the, the curve. And I'll stick that point. And then I'll just go fill all the rest of them in. And that seemed like such a good idea. And it didn't really work. And here's why. And part of this is just where it's probably my technique. I like to solder with a lot of heat. I like to get the rail good and hot. I like to get the tie good and hot. I like to make sure the solder flows really nice and get a good strong joint. And, um... And when you do that, you start putting a lot of heat in the rail. And this is just code 70 rail. It, it heats up real fast. And when you heat it up real fast, metal expands. And if you have restrained it at both ends and you start soldering in the middle, you start getting all these funny little kinks. And all of a sudden your nice smooth curve isn't a nice smooth curve anymore. So just... uh. Thing I've learned along the way. Just start at one end, let one end be free, and, uh, and just sort of solder as you go. Okay, so just because uh, I'm on a roll right now making frog rails, I might make this one, and this side of the ladder is done for all its uh, stock rails, and I'll go back and start making uh, closure rails, which every time I go to do that, I think it's going to be this big thing, and it's just not. It's uh, real easy. So, uh, yeah, we'll come back. All right, I got the last of the frogs in. No problems there. So let's start working point rails so I like to do the diverging route first um, no special reason I'm sure it doesn't make a hill of beans a difference uh, which one you do first uh, I just like doing the curved one first because I, I don't know I feel like maybe it's harder and I just want to get the harder one out of the way first um, so here's where I start I cut a piece of rail that is a little bit longer than what I know I'm going to need. And then what I'll do is kind of judge 
where I think the frog's gonna go. And, uh, where's my marker? Oh. Typical. Misplace my marker. But, what I'll do, once I find my marker, is, um, I'll come in here and mark where I'm going to notch to bend the the wing. Um, and I'll bend that wing and I'll kind of start forming the rail. Um, and I'm just going to let that be long. And once I kind of get it formed, then I'll cut the end of the point rail uh, where I think it should be and, and file the, the form onto it. Um, so let me go ahead and do those things and we'll, we'll see what it looks like. Okay. So there is that point rail made. I sit and bend it until it doesn't necessarily have to perfectly fit, but I want it to be pretty close to engage anywhere I check it just laying there. And... Oops, you can kind of see the, the bend I put on there, and the flare I grind right onto the very end. And that's pretty important, because as that rail sits there, that kind of gives some lead into the flange rolling in. Um, we've got the, the flat worked on to the end of the point. And uh, now there's nothing to do but uh, solder that guy in place. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay. So there's that point rail put in. So when I use the triangular gauges, it's important to put the two on the... Oh boy, I don't want to describe this. No. I got that backwards, don't I? Well, when you're in a curve with these triangular points, yeah, that's the right way right there. Um, depending on which way you put them on, they're either a little wider or a little narrower. Um, so, if you put it on this way, you kind of get a little bit wider gauge, and again, that allows for you know, some longer, stiffer locomotives to go through there and not really have any problems. Um, so once that's all in, so right there is your last solder point. So I like to come down and just, you know, check with my gauge and just make sure everything looks okay. And if it's not, believe it or not, you can just kind of take your finger in here and, and work that rail until you, you get a pretty good form. And then the last thing is to take the flange way and just check that there that nothing's, nothing's tight. That's the next way you get some humpity bumpity going through the switch. So that is that. And then uh, I just kind of take a truck and roll her through. You kind of got to influence it, you know, without the guardrails or anything else there yet, but everything seems pretty good. Um, and then if you look this way, you, know, you can really see that that's just a nice smooth curve going out through the switch. And I think that's maybe why I like doing the curved rail first, is because this is a pretty good visual check. Uh, and it's a little bit harder to see once the straight rail's in. And let's just look at the next switch. It's just a little bit harder to see. Especially once the point rails are joined together on the throw bar. So, all right, I'll go ahead and do the straight rail and get the guardrails in 
and then there's nothing left to do but uh, do the throw bar. All right, so there is the throw bar put in, and everything's looking nicely engaged. Not gonna hold over on its own. But you get the idea. So nice smooth transition that way. And like I said, it helps a lot if you gauge that out to the kind of plus side of uh things and even though I can't I don't have enough hands here I think you can imagine that's just as smooth going that way Let's see So you probably have noticed, and I haven't actually gapped any of these PC board ties yet, so I like to build them all, get everything kind of done in the rails the way I like them, and then I just come back and just nip them with the, the Dremel, um, and cut all the frog gaps and everything else kind of all at the same time. So couple more of these to do and I'll start wiring up this end all right so got the ladder built now to start wiring it and getting the, the motors in so um, I have recycled a lot of these uh, tortoise machines from the layout I tore down in South Carolina uh, and when I tore that layout down I kind of had to do it in a hurry so you know I just chopped the wires uh, to save the machine. So what I want to do now is unsolder all this, get it cleaned up. I've got eight lengths of wire here and I will get it all attached to this terminal bar. Okay, so here's this all cleaned up. Um, so I, I guess just a couple notes. Um, if you're newer to the hobby and you're wondering why this is necessary, um, the you know the little connector block here. Uh, short answer: It isn't. Um, I didn't use them for years because I would look at people using these, and I'd be like, it just seems like an unnecessary step. I could just wire everything right to the the switch machine. And you can. There's there's nothing really wrong with it. Um, but if you ever have to take something apart, or you have to start troubleshooting, or you change, you know, what you want to use any of the terminals for, it gets to be a little bit of a pain in the butt. And working under the lab, it can be a little bit of a pain in the butt. Um, so having these just easy screw terminals where you're not trying to solder upside down and uh, you, know, you can just easily pull something out and stick something in or swap places if you have you know polarity backwards these just make your life a lot easier nicer it's a convenience um, so along with that just uh, general thoughts about you know how I do things here obviously I got a, a sizable project going here so cost matters um that's why i started laser cutting my own ties and building my own switches and 
uh, these terminal bars I found on Amazon. They're dirt cheap. I mean, I literally just sat and shopped one night till I said, what's the cheapest terminal bar I can find? And then work around that. Um, and then I, I use blue wire um, for all my switch machine connections, just so when I'm under the layout and I'm looking, if it's a blue wire, I know it's got something to do with the switch motor. Um, anyway, um, now that I have this much set up, I have drilled a hole in my throw bar. Uh, I do that with a little pin vise, um, just because I don't want to have the weight of a drill pushing on my, my track work. And then I laser cut these little templates. So use your imagination here. I, I feed a wire, piano wire, down through the layout, through the, through the, um, oh my gosh, I just said it, the throw bar. So I feed that down through the throw bar, and then I feed through that hole on my little template, which is representative of where the, the rod comes up from the switch machine. And then I just kind of slide this around under the layout till that rod's going straight up and down. And then pilot drill the hole locations. And that lets me stick this up and, and screw it in real easy. Um, I really hate working upside down. It'd be great if I could build the layout upside down and flip it over, but a layout like this, I don't really think that's a realistic option. Um, anyway, um, so I got this much done. I'll go ahead and get the switch motor uh, screwed in and uh, check everything for adjustment. We'll find a place to mount uh, mount this, and we'll start uh, we'll start wiring it up. All right, got the switch machine mounted up and wires all tied up there. So you can see I've got these couple bare copper wires and I just stripped those out of an old piece of Romex. Um, they are 12 volt DC uh, power bus for turnout motors. So I will grab power off that, run it through my switch and run it back to that terminal block to power the switch machine. And for you non-seasoned people out there, this is a double throw, double pole switch, DP, DT. Uh, the way this works, each side of three is independent of the other side. And the center terminals are always live and depending which way you throw the switch you either connect you know the right side of the middle or the left side of the middle so what you can do is you pull well, let me back up the switch machines are powered by 12 volt dc and you just switch the polarity to change the position of the switch so power out to the switch can come from the middle. You bring your power in to one side, and then you wire jumpers from one corner to the opposite corner. So when you throw the switch, you're feeding opposite polarity uh, to the middle. So pretty simple. Uh, lots of fancier ways of doing this, uh, and I probably will for some of my control points, like wire it into the DCC system so I can throw it from JMRI or my throttle. Uh, but this is kind of the old school way of doing it, and it's how I'm going to handle the yard, where there's just just a toggle switch on uh, on the front of the layout, and it's you just throw the switch and it throws the points. Um, nice and easy, nice and simple. So uh, I got my blue wire links cut up here to get the switch kind of pre-wired and uh, I'll be back in a minute. So just to pause for a second, um, the center two terminals I haven't wired yet, that'll be the power going to the motor. 
the long wires will connect to my bus. And then you can see the little short wires there just flip the polarity side to side. Yes, I'm watching Star Wars in the background. Um, so depending which position the switch is in, you get different polarity. And it's simple as that. Easy peasy. Sounds complicated, but it, it's not. All right, so there's the switch, all wired. I make these little laser cut uh, toggle holders so I can just sort of screw them in from the back and mount them uh, under the layout like that. And um, you can see my connections to the bus bar there and wires are into the terminal bar. All those slots in the middle there will be for controlling the um, power for the frog, um, which I probably won't go into in this video, but um, you can see the points there. You can see the switch here. And if I click the switch over, that's, that's what we want to see. So. There's diverging and that's straight. So, all right, well, that's about it. Uh, how I build my switch, uh, switches and yard ladders and uh, get them all wired up for operation. One down, a lot to go. See you guys next time.